All right, people, we're at it again. And this time it's another big one, a midpoint episode and a midpoint episode to boot season six, episode five, The Door. Or as a lot of you will come to know it, and Pat, I'm going to see your thunder here for a, bit, a little bit. Hold the door. 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 I don't know. That wasn't one of my yeah, I don't know. I don't know if the Talking TV family uh, appreciates that impression. But, I don't know uh, if they were ready for that. Uh, it's not one of my best. I'll yeah, admit. we're, we're going to be talking thrones here. And, uh, you know, at least the, the, at the very least, you got to step up from sort of the stark, random village idiot, so to speak, to uh, a bellhop. You know, he's That's holding true. that door. He's, he's getting there. You know, he's getting there. Uh, everyone descends in this world in some way, shape or form. Bran becomes king by the end. All that and more on tonight's episode of Talking Thrones. Oh, man, I wasn't sure if I gave you an opportunity to capitalize off that. But welcome back, people. It's another <laughs> Well, the episode. other way I could have taken the joke was uh, what you're talking about, Willis. To, oh, I was uh, waiting for that. different I'm strokes. Surprised. I'm um, surprised there wasn't a different strokes <laughs> reference. You're like prime demographic for that, I feel. Hey, listen, uh, you know, when I was younger and I think that show was on like syndication, so I, I definitely watched it a lot and, you know, it was a pretty good sitcom. So uh, Willis here, uh, you know, in Game of Thrones, uh, I was... Happy to hear that name once again in television after Absolutely. years of, of not. <laughs> yeah, it, it's been a while. I feel like Willis has not been is not been well utilized and well capitalized upon. People, obviously, this is another episode of Talking Thrones, but it's a pretty important one. It's a pretty big one, obviously, in hindsight. You know, season six, episode five, entitled The Door. This is infamously the episode, the moment, kind of the revelation behind Hodor's condition as a result of Bran, you know, working a little a couple places where he shouldn't be learning the origin of the Nightwalkers and unintentionally intentionally inviting them into commit another I'll say, call it a hard home attempt an attempt at replicating the spirit of hard home because it's so strange because I'll say that the that the sequence itself is so horrifying in its presentation that it's one of those things where in hindsight you almost remember oh wait Miguel Sapochnik didn't direct this episode you know famously this is you know this is the second to last season where they brought in some new guys you know they famously had Jack Bender direct episodes three and four who had directed a lot it was another one of those TV veterans who's directed so many different episodes of television throughout his long career directed a ton of episodes for lost um and obviously famously directed the last two episodes and now we have daniel sackheim directing this episode of the next both of which are episodes that have pretty big sequences in them but like we were talking about pat like so many other things they're so great for in the moment but in the long run what do they ultimately matter because as is literally referenced in the next season when mira just leaves the show she literally says hodor and summer died for you and and she can't even call him by his real name willis and bran is just kind of like yeah Oh, okay. I'm fine. You know, it just kind of pieces out. So, I mean, the, the, the Willis reveal, obviously we're going to talk about it in detail at the end of the episode, but it's one of those things that's like where it came in, it was just like one of those, oh shit moments, you know, because it's building off of this crazy big action sequence. And surprisingly enough, it's one of those moments that I feel like has aged poorly for a lot of Game of Thrones fans. Like, I feel like it's one of the things where when you talk to Game of Thrones fans, they're like, some of them are like, yeah, that I thought that was stupid. Why is time travel in Game of Thrones? It doesn't make sense. It especially doesn't make sense here. And, yet, and ultimately, what does it matter in the long run? Because as we see, Hodor's yeah. death, what does that matter in the long run? The, the time traveling stuff was actually awesome when it was introduced. And then it didn't really tie into the end game of the show. So that's that's really what the big problem is. It's like, hey, remember that season where they had time travel in the show? Oh, yeah, they got rid of it. <laughs> you know, so uh, that becomes a problem in the uh, last uh, two seasons. Uh, the other thing is this sequence actually is really good. I, I think it's fantastic. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that you're comparing it to Hard Home. But, yeah, it, it kind of gives... Well, that it feels so sort reminiscent of... of it just because of, like, the setup, how it kind of comes out of nowhere, how they very subtly visually hint at it. There are even bits of the score that feel like kind of this massive onslaught from which there's no escape where they're literally trying to fight their lives to escape from, you know? That it's yeah, just, it's, it's, just... it's another giant attack by the Night King that shows off, like, really how scary that army is. And, uh, you know, it has to happen every season, right? We have to be reminded that the Night King is out there with his hordes of zombies. 
Absolutely, yeah. And so it's one of those things where it, it, it's, it kind of almost feels like a quota as well because after so much buildup with these guys and so much like kind of hinting and emphasis on them and an entire season where we basically didn't see them only to get hard home last season and finally reminded, oh, this is what the show has been building to this entire time, you know? It, it's one of those things where, like I said, the action is awesome in the moment, but because how does it really factor into the end game? You know, like I said, we get the magic, we get the time travel, but we literally have only spent, like, again, because they cut Bran out of an entire season, we literally only spent a maximum of two episodes with the Children of the Forest and the Three-Eyed Raven. And hindsight, it's honestly pretty impressive how much they were able to just cram into those two episodes because those two episodes basically have to set up for Bran interacting with everyone else for the entire rest of the show, you know, setting up the, the, the R plus L equals J, you know, setting up the Willis reveal and kind of how that pays off as well as kind of giving us a slight origin to the Night Walk, to the White Walkers as well. You know, obviously with the revelation in this episode that the Children of the Forest created them as sort of this defense mechanism against the invaders, you know, when the First Men were originally crossing over again, tying a little bit into that awesome lore that was such a prevalent part of the show at one point. You know, I don't know, Pat, what did you think of the Night King reveal or the origin, I should say, when it was first came in in this episode? Uh, hey, listen, I think there's a lot about this sequence and you know, obviously we're going to go into it more in detail at the end of, of this particular uh, podcast episode. But um, I, I like it. I think it's very concise. You know, it basically sums up things really quickly. It's a nice way of tying the Night King and Bran into some sort of, you know, bigger battle. Like, you know, they, they are two uh, sort of magical figures at this point. He's the three eyed Raven and it's the Night King. Uh, so brands inheriting this history, uh, you know, and all this knowledge about how the Night King was created. And so this is now uh, brands burden. He has to see it to the end. And I think there's sort of that handoff of the baton. Um, what I will say is, uh, you know, I found it interesting when you brought up the fact that people sort of hate this moment and don't really like, you know, O door slash hold the door and, um, you know, don't like the time travel stuff. Um, I have a, a theory about that, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to save that for the end of the episode when we talk more in detail about it uh, so that, you know, I can bring up my like thoughts on why this particular episode, um, you know, this sequence might rub people the wrong way. So let, let's, let's jump into uh, one of the other areas of the show and we'll get back to, uh, you know, the, the big moment, the finale of, of the episode uh, towards the end of our episode here tonight. It's interesting because, again, I talk so much about how the end sequence of this episode reminds me kind of episode of Hard Home. Not only the specific moment of Hard Home, but also the episode as well in which it happens. And it's another one where it's like the event is so big and overshadows so much the rest of the episode that you forget that there's also a lot of other important stuff that happens in this episode. Like, we got a lot of big reveals. Uh, like I said, after kind of the revamp and reset up of the last episode, you really get to see, like, a lot of characters finally moving towards some of the final destinations, not only for the end of this season, but also for the rest of the show. And that starts right in Bravos with Arya, you know? You start off with more of the stupid training between her and the Wave for the Wave, because once again, uh, oh, you'll <laughs> yeah, never more be fist fighting. Us. Exactly, like, oh, you'll never be with us. Oh, you'll never be a uh, faceless man. I'm, it, it's like, she's reminding me, she's, a, she's the, the Wave has become the Draco Malfoy of the show, and if this were a kids-based property, I wouldn't mind, but because Game of Thrones has gone so out of its way to be so adult and so mature for a, a majority of its run, that it's things like this that when you throw in these little immature dumb twists and i'm like really what are we doing here you know but listen dom i think the waif is uh 100 ready for to be a dlc character in a game like mortal Kombat. i mean um, she may as well know, already just, be an npc so yeah well just just like an out of nowhere playable character that has you know the many faces uh, I think Mortal Kombat fans and Game of Thrones fans would be behind that idea. So, you know, so I, someone's probably out there in the audience ready yeah, someone's to gotta be. jump on and start a petition for that. But uh, think about it. Um, it would really justify the Waif character if it was uh, sort of this downloadable content for Mortal Kombat. Because otherwise, the Waif is... Uh, what what other justification is there for this character? Oh, man. Well, it's bad. Hey, listen, it, it's, it kind of continues the storyline, but... Uh, I, I think the two of us have sort of beaten that horse, so to speak. Uh, uh, you Among know, many it, other dead horses whose bodies are yeah, it, it's held, fortunately. Like, I think the waif is good when you, you know, don't have the hindsight of seeing the whole series because it, it's suspenseful, right? You know, it's kind of bringing you into, like, who is this character? Uh, there's opposition against Arya. You know, it's like she's beating her up and Arya doesn't seem to be able to get the upper hand. So it kind of, you know, obviously gives an antagonist to the storyline. Uh, but where's the, the giant payoff? And, you know, I, I think the payoff is really cool at the, you know, towards the end of the season. Uh, it's just how they handle it in the next two seasons that becomes like, oh, what, 
What? They just they just pivoted. Yeah. They just changed the storyline completely. Yeah, completely. Um, so I'm going to just, you know, in season six, since we're here, I'm going to live in the moment. I'm just going to enjoy this. Like, you know, uh, the waif is, is bringing her internal uh, moral combat abilities and, and not dishing out any friendships, uh, just smacking Arya around. And, uh, you know, Arya has got to figure out a way to, to really, you know, fit, complete her training, despite the fact that she has this, uh, you know, unrelenting antagonist in front of her. Absolutely, yeah. And the the other thing, too, that is finally established in this episode is this is the establishment of the play arc, which is one of the more underrated elements of the books, one of the kind of like the last vestiges, one of those last threads from the books that are still hanging on. And I actually think it does a pretty damn good job of adapting that, you know, because the, the play arc, obviously famously where Arya has given her first assignment since getting her eyesight back into the faceless man and Jack gives her the mission of assassinating an actress named Lady Crane, who is an actress in this traveling troupe that is, re that is doing a reenactment of the War of the Five kings but like obviously more so from a commoner's perspective so there's certain different things from the first four seasons whose perspectives are changed joffrey's presented as much more of an uh, you know, of, as yeah. a benevolent figure same with cersei Tyrion is kind of portrayed as like the evil one who's been behind it all ned stark is portrayed as kind of a bumbling fool who doesn't really know what he's doing and is being way laid and manipulated and it's so fascinating to see that because again it kind of serves almost the same purpose that the trial for Tyrion did way back in season four in that it's serving as like a commentary almost on the first four seasons and while while Arya, damn, someone was revving their engine. Hard. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I must have had a motorcycle by. It's it's and, crazy how loud that was. It uh, was, yeah. yeah. And so it's and so, but you also have Arya in the audience who is like being a direct witness to a majority of the events that they are at least portraying. Especially, I love the reaction that Maisie Williams gave at the scene when Ned Stark died, when well, obviously when the when the actor Ned Stark loses his head as well. And uh, you know, it kind of remind brought me back to season one and kind of you know where Arya was and kind of how far she's come. You know, come one of those like come full circle moments. And I think it's really interesting how the big thing that's established here. Of Amongst this arc and kind of, you know, as far as the setup for Arya being ready to leave the Faceless Men is it kind of shows that, you know, the, the note that I have written down is that it's that so much for honor amongst the Faceless Men. You know, I feel like she's always kind of gravitated towards the Faceless Men because she just felt like she had nothing else. She felt like she had been pretty much abandoned. All her family members were either dead or too far away to help each other. You know, there was this constant repetitive pattern of her getting to people over and over and over again and just, you know, them being dead or dying for the time she could get to it. And so she came to Bravos because she thought it was going to be this last connection. And it's so interesting where this play almost serves to remind her what it is that she she left behind in conjunction with the faceless men who are now kind of act essentially so, so basically having her carry out this act as like this ruthless bounty hunter you know where she kind of once again thought that she was joining this organization that had some sense of honor almost serving to preserve some of that honor that is inherent in her in the north and this episode is starting to pull back the rafters and be like no death comes for everyone you know and you kind of just have to get on board with it you know yeah you know listen i i enjoyed this play a lot i i thought it was a nice break from watching game of thrones to really just have like this kind of snarky self-reflective recap of the first couple seasons and you know it's it's obviously for Arya it's a nightmare because it's it's not at all how it happened it makes her family uh you know look like the enemies here and i, I think that's really you know it kind of phrases it into her character and what she's going through and how she feels about um, you know, looking back at her family and what she's about to do. She has to kind of like separate herself from, you know, her history and sort of, you know, dive deep into the faceless men. So, um, you know, regardless, the play was great. It added some great laughs for, you know, the, the opening of this episode and, and gave us like um, a nice sense that they're willing to, you know, make fun of themselves or be self-reflective and, and sort of, you know, change things a little bit, uh, with the, the previous plot line. They're, they're not necessarily taking themselves seriously in this sequence. Um, the one thing that I will say, you know, from watching game of Thrones and talking about it on this podcast for the last couple of seasons, um, you know, I, I don't really remember like this huge amount of, of nudity, at yeah, all. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so in this particular episode, it's like it's all back. It's like, yeah. uh, you know, uh, full frontal, basically, <laughs> for the most part. And, you know, I'm just like, wow. You know, I, I don't think we've seen that really uh, in previous episodes. Or, or maybe it's just like, you know, uh, suge more suggested, more like ha happens off camera, you know. 
So the show apparently right here in you know season six, episode five, becomes like a little more racy. Uh, so yeah. bravos, um, you know. If anything, you know, you're, they're almost commentating on the vast and sometimes criticized amounts of nudity that were very apparent in those first four seasons, and then became progressively less so. Ironically enough, at around the same time that the sparrows sacked Littlefinger's brothels last season. Yeah. So uh, it, man, it, it is night and day because I was just. You know, you know, Game of Thrones, you know, most HBO shows, most, you know, premium channel shows like it could be Showtime, uh, Netflix, etc. Uh, a lot of these shows are going to not really be afraid of nudity if, if they're behind some sort of paywall uh, that's kind of comes with the territory. And I was just surprised at like, you know, how much I haven't really uh, thought about it in Game of Thrones the last couple seasons of us doing this podcast. Uh, it really sort of just melted into the background. And I think you're right, you know, with the Sparrow coming in and sort of this uh, moral storyline, like, you know, it seems like that could have been, you know, uh, either a choice or that could have been just like happenstance. But um, to have it in this episode was sort of like, whoa, you know, I, I wasn't expecting that. Um, and, you know, obviously it's a, about this theater troupe uh, that's really comfortable with the, uh, each other and they're. Uh, you know, it's part of their show, too, because they want to attract uh, people to pay attention and pay money and, and whatnot. But, you know, the the group of actors is comfortable with themselves uh, that they really have this, uh, you know, open, you know, relationship where they're able to make jokes and talk about, uh, you know, um, those things uh, quite openly. So, um, yeah, it was, it was sort of uh, interesting uh, to to stumble across this and just be like, Oh yeah, this is a HBO show. And, and, you know, sometimes we can have gratuitous nudity. Yes, absolutely. So we then move on to the wall. Like I said, the, the wall has essentially become like the centerpiece of the storyline. You know, it's kind of funny how King, for so much of the show's run, King's Landing was kind of the centerpiece of the storyline. And now you kind of see the last season was kind of this transition into the wall becoming the centerfold as they started to move towards more so John and Daenerys being the main characters as they started to drift away and make King's Landing and Cersei more of a supporting character. And now I feel like we're fully there because it's to the point where even when it's in the storyline at its most minimalist, get, like the like the wall and everything now going on with John has become a centerpiece. And the other note that I had written down here as well about this arc is this is the last time that John is at the wall for a while. It's the last time, obviously, you know, he's already abandoned his position as Lord Commander, but it's kind of so interesting because despite the fact that it was never the main center stage for the longest time, it was always kind of setting up for this larger kind of overlooming threat. The wall has become such a concrete and centerfold staple of the story that the fact that this will be the last time that we see it for a while, you know, it. it, it we, we check in with it periodically over the next two seasons, but like the wall, a, a large portion of it is destroyed at the end of next season, not even like 10 episodes from now. So I, I just think that that's super fascinating. But the biggest thing here is obviously we get a Sansa Littlefinger reunion as Littlefinger writes her a letter to meet him in Molestown. And just this scene, like, I'll say this. I was literally talking about it when I watched the episode this morning. I watched the episode this morning and I was like, I'm trying to, I'm constantly at a loss as to which character, which one of, I should say, which fan favorite, like, which one of my favorite characters, I should say, the show betrayed more. It's constantly at a battle for me between Tyrion and Littlefinger, depending on the episode, because, like, I'll say that, like, it's not, again, it's not that they're doing things that are out of touch with his character. It's that they feel like they're forgetting that this is a character who can see 10 steps ahead. And it feels like they're just having him do things that, like, he would do if he wasn't as smart as he was, you know, where he's trying to play this tactful game of offering up the Knights of the Veil to Sansa while also offering up this news of the Blackfish that kind of comes out of nowhere, you know, like there's no setup for it. You don't see him receiving a raven, nothing. All of a sudden, he, he magically just tells her, oh, your uncle, your great uncle, the Blackfish, has retaken River Run, and that's an army that you could use, you know. And we obviously see how she later ends up using that in the meeting with John and Davos. The biggest thing that's established here is is this is the beginning of kind of the real transition from Littlefinger to Sansa as this amazing, like, strategician. And this is the beginning of Sansa beginning to outwit Littlefinger, kind of use him where she needs to, and then give up. You know, I'll say that the sequence is amazingly well-written, Sophie Turner. This is really the beginning to me of, like, Sophie Turner as, like, okay, this is her turnaround. This is Sansa really coming into her own. And she does an impeccable job, I think, with the delivery of that performance as far as, like, you know, oh, so you've, you've heard, you know, what he did. You know, tell me what he did. Tell me what you think he did to my face you know it's this really i think i i i dare not use this word because it's i feel like it's become so overdone and completely misused in today's culture but it's really 
empowering to see that in the moment, this character who is been the result of so much tragedy over the last couple of seasons, finally being able to turn some of that back on her captors, you know? Yeah, so what I will say is that this sequence, what it does is, you know, at one point, Brienne, you know, gives her readings to Sansa, like, oh, John's okay, but he's kind of brooding, ain't he? I guess that's to be expected, right? Because he was resurrected. Um, so for the most part, I like Brienne's candid take on John and how it sort of like uh, diminishes him in a way where it's like, yeah, he's kind of, you know, off to the side. He's, you know, doing his own thing. And with Sansa in this sequence, stepping up and really starting to play the game, you know, going back to meet Littlefinger and basically confront him say that you're either my enemy or the stupidest man alive or it could be both, you know, who knows? It could be both in this but case. <laughs> the fact is... I mean, the one should have been pretty apparent from minute one, but again, she was yeah, a little more so, naive, so... So I, I really enjoy the fact that Sansa is starting to step up, starting to really fight for what she believes in and start playing the game and manipulating the situation. And that's one of the things that she hasn't really been doing she's just kind of been going along to get along and that's not really been going well for her uh you know so much tragedy has happened in her storyline and you know she's traumatized and of course she's you know pretty uh public about that pretty public about the terrible things that have happened to her and you know with Littlefinger uh you know is it confronts him and says this you basically knew this was going to happen and the fact that he just tries to squirm his way out of it by being like oh yeah i just misjudged someone you know a stranger from afar <laughs> it's like no one believes that no one believes and, that yeah and it, i agree with you in the sense that you know littlefinger has always been given the you know 10 step ahead and and like proven himself to be that smart and there is no game that he's playing here. Like it, it would be different if he was playing at some game and you know, we, he basically loses the game for the first time. Like Sansa perfectly read him and, and like manipulated him. Um, that would be a cool storyline, but I don't think that ultimately what this becomes. So maybe uh, that's what they were aiming for. Maybe they just didn't have enough screen time to really develop that. Uh, but obviously I think, I think you're right. Like it, uh, Littlefinger in, in the last few seasons does not feel like uh, himself, you know, that's introduced in the first half of the series. Um, so, yeah, I, I think mainly here, uh, you know, Sansa is shown as really willing to do anything to get what she wants. John is still trying to figure things out and brooding, uh, so to speak. So, you know, who, who as the audience, who are we going to choose? Are we going to choose Sansa, who is proactive and making these decisions and really fighting for what we've been told, uh, which is the Stark name in Winterfell, that's really the good guys. That's that's who we're supposed to be rooting for. Or John, who's just sort of brooding and, and trying to figure things out and doesn't really know what to do. Um, you know, obviously he is concerned about the Night King, but like at this moment he is really having you know some post resurrection struggles and kind of gaining his feet, you know, back on the ground. Absolutely. If anything, it's kind of almost like he has to remind himself when they're kind of doing that little strat strategic meeting later on where he's like, we can't defend, you know, it's like, we kind of can't stay here at the wall. It's one of those moments where it's like, again, that was one of those like kind of last messages of like the week to week viewing in order to kind of recap you because again, they kind of had already established last episode that they could not stay at the wall because he's like, look, we, we can't muster a force to defend against the walkers if we have to defend against the Boltons first, you know, we have to defeat the one before the other, you know, so that, like, that's the one bit of where it's like, okay, that's a little bit of like strategic John coming back, if not a little bit obvious, and then leave it to Davos, obviously, to point out some of the obvious where Sansa, it's weird because Sansa's like, it's in this weird spot where she's starting to become a, str a, str no, a strategist, that's the word I was looking for. But at the same time, she's still a little bit too naive as far as there goes, where she's like, oh, the Umbers and the Cars, she's like, oh, the Umbers, you know, betrayed, you know, gave up Rickon to Ramsey, but, you know, they can hang. But the Car Stars, they may not have had a choice. And Davos is like, has to, almost has to remind her. It's like, yeah, but they know that a Stark cut off their liege lord's head. So good luck trying to get them as well, you know? And so that, that kind of leaves them in order to try and do this, like, kind of sham campaign as far as, like, okay, we can get a combination of the Wildlings, the rest of the houses in the north, and then if, and then obviously Sansa brings up the idea about the blackfish retaking river run and she's like we can if, and he's like okay if we could get the tully army to march north then we 
might actually have a shot here, you know? And it, it gives Davos confidence. John is a little bit more sneaky, and he's like, okay, where did you learn that from? And Sansa makes up another lie about, you know, what's it called? And sends up, makes up another lie saying, oh, Ramsey, you know, again, Ramsey's just becoming a very, very convenient excuse. You know, she magically figured out that Ramsey killed his father in the last episode, despite there being absolutely no reason for her to know that. You know, she kind of just guessed it. And yeah, so but I, I think the best part is that, you know, when, after she gives this lie, Brienne, in a private conversation, calls her out on calls it. Calls her out for it. And, you know, I think I think that's good. I think, you know, the fact that Brienne sees what Sansa is doing and gives her a little bit of like... You know, hey, is this moralistically right? You know, John is your kin and you need to, you know, you're sort of trampling on that relationship bond. And, you know, Sansa kind of knows what she's doing or at least feels she knows what she's doing. And so it leaves us in that sense of like, you know, oh, are they going to get along? Are they going to be kind of at right. odds? That really for this season and I believe into the next season, Definitely uh, they, into the next season, to an extent, the final season. But yeah, so they they give this, you know, they give this basically, uh, you know, uh, combative problem uh, between Sansa and John. And right. I don't think it's bad for for the characters going forward. Uh, I think it's not know, bad for now. I think it gets a little bit mucked up in the final season because it definitely comes to a point where it's like, okay, Sansa is either where it's like, okay, John has become a simp and Sansa is either too untrustworthy or too smart for her own good, depending on how the writing feels where it's going to take it to the point where it's almost like John is punished and Sansa is rewarded despite the fact that it feels like it should be the opposite, you know? Yeah, you know, hey, we'll get to the uh, end of the series when we get there and, and talk about how, uh, you know, things are mucked up. But, uh, hey, like, man, we're jumping around. So, yeah. Well, um, let, let, let's go over the two sequence, the two quick, other quick sequences in Essos first before we hit the King's Moot, and then we'll wrap up with Bran. So, let's start with, um, I don't know, do you want to do Daenerys or do you want to do Tyrion first? Oh, I was going to jump to the Dothraki Sea. So, I guess Dothraki, it is Daenerys, yeah, so quick you know. scene. Quick scene, quick insert scene. It's kind of only there, you know, emotion. I'm shocked because I feel like this is a scene that we weren't going to get in this episode. But then the fact that we got it like immediately after, you know, kind of this much needed resolution between Daenerys and Jorah, this kind of one last lingering thread that's been held over from season five into this season. And yeah, it's, it's a well shot sequence, too. I was like, man, look how yeah. like, you know beautiful this, this scene is of like, you know, her being freshly empowered with the new Dothraki army and like. Uh, you know, she's in the sunset and there's this dramatic like wind going on. Dario and Jorah are there on the mountain with her. And it's like, you know, I can't banish you. You keep coming back, you know, <laughs> like yeah. all it's, it's like this poetic speech. She's like, and she's then, like you're like a bad, she's like, you're like a bad ex-boyfriend. You just, I just can't keep you away. Yeah. And then he rolls up his arm and he's like, I got the dragon scale. So you yeah. gotta send me away and I'll off myself when I get the chance to, you know, like, whoa. Yeah. And it's like, I've always I loved you. And, and it's so emotional too. Like Daenerys is like, he's literally like saying, Hey, I love you. You were, you were right. Like this is no longer a secret. And she's like, you know, holding back the tears and, you know, wants him to be by her side, but he, you know, he betrayed her. And, and so she's like an emotional yeah. mess. It, it, it's, um, a, it's an emotional it's scene well all around. And I'll say this, like the emotion does work. I know some people might criticize this for being a little over sappy for me. I think it's a surprisingly well-earned moment between again, two characters that have such this long history together. You know, Jora, Jor people forget this too, but like I have constantly been about this too. I'm like, yeah, there are literally only nine main cast members who have been around since the first episode who have been in every single episode all the way up until the final season not necessarily all the way up until the final episode but and, and Jara has been one of them and so the fact that you kind of are having this almost cathartic much needed moment that's kind of been built up since the end of season four finally happening like it's super satisfying to see you know and it's one of those things where it one of rather the few moments in this sector of the show where the emotional impact is actually earned and even though and, you know, Jorah obviously goes back to her and then obviously, you know, achieves his dream of dying, fighting and defending her in his service. And his death, I think, in season eight is one of the few that actually is really tragic and really heartbreaking. You know, I will say that um, what's it called? I, I, again, I, I think this moment is well earned and very, very well done. There's not much more I can say about it. And I think that. the Yeah, no, she, I 100 percent agree with you. Like this scene is well earned. And the fact is, like we, we're talking about a lot during season five and six, the idea of, you know, things not really being built up. And things coming quick and, and them not having enough screen time, they're just kind of like, okay, write this scene and let's get done with it. Let's move on to the next character. 
And I feel like this particular scene, because we have the character histories, um, they come in in this episode. It's kind of like right in the middle of the storyline. They're kind of on the hill. They're giving this emotional back and forth. And everything just plays really nice. And it's because we, the viewer, are emotionally invested as well into these characters. And we understand the implication of what's being said in this scene. Uh, and it's been set up for, you know, six seasons. So when they come in and they land a really good scene like this and then bounce, you know, it works. You know, it's that's all the hard work that they put in from the previous seasons. You know, so it, it's one of those things where... Um, you know, some of the characters that had been with us for a long time, like Osha last, uh, you know, episode when she got murdered by Ramsey, uh, again, that was kind of a, a scene out of nowhere, uh, not really that much time, but like, because we know Ramsey, we know Osha, um, you know, I feel like it was a very fitting end to that character, uh, because they, you know, acted the way that we come to expect them to act. Uh, and it just didn't work out for Osha. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of these scenes that kind of pop in and out, you know, for the rest of the series uh, that are really kind of well crafted. And it comes from all the, the history that we have with those characters from the, the previous, you know, six seasons or seven seasons, whatever it is when the moments happen of the show, we're, we're kind of vested. Um, so there are a lot of these moments where we're excited to to finally see happen on the screen. Uh, and then there's other moments where, you know, it just doesn't seem like that was developed that much. So, um, you know, again, the show is going to give us both of these for the rest of this, the series. Uh, and we're just going to have to pick and choose what we actually enjoy versus what, you know, just needed to happen to get us to the end of the story. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. So then the other sequence, again, my my favorite storyline so far this season, but surprisingly, yeah, again, so much to the point where I'm like, yeah, you have to put this in every episode. But surprisingly enough, a scene that is bearable in comparison to the last couple of episodes, which I'm sorry, but like everything building up to Tyrion meeting with the slave masters was just fucking painful pardon my french as far as wow, how yeah, stupidly you, you obvious it was expletive angry about this you know? but <laughs> the convara scene in this episode despite the fact that it is again still the most apparent that it goes nowhere because it's like it's so weird how they build it up where you have this conversation obviously between Tyrion, varus gray worm and missande where varus is like okay you know i think it's safe to say that a fragile peace has been achieved just based on how few attacks have happened and Tyrion's like it's not enough you know you have to restore security you know they have to believe in Daenerys and he comes up with this half-baked idea to bring in the Red Priestess because of one one-off scene that he saw last season at the very beginning of his journey towards Essos you know and so the, the Kinvara scene it's well written and I think as a hearkening back to Varys's you know story that he told Tyrion of how he was cut originally and how that led to his distaste and distrust of magic I think it's a really underrated element of Varys's character that I think almost kind of got went overlooked and I think it's one of the few things that saves his character in the later seasons uh is the fact that they kind of bring that back the fact that he has this healthy skepticism of magic if anything it could almost be a silent contributor into why he start into why he trusts Daenerys less and less as he actually you know starts to spend time with and see the types of people that flock to her. So where Tyrion invites this red priestess in order to try and speak the word, you know, it, it, I also think it's kind of fascinating. The other thing that this sequence gives you in the sense of where for the majority of your time, you've pretty much only met two red priestesses, Melisandre, who's been diehard for Stannis up until this point, and Thoros, who's kind of all but abandoned the red faith and really only uses it when he kind of needs it in order to resurrect Beric Dondarrion. I find it ironic because this is also the season where we get Beric Dondarrion and Thoros of Mere back as well. And this is the first red priestess that is almost kind of batting for Daenerys. And so even though it's a moment that kind of comes out of nowhere and is like okay she's the one that's chosen and that's kind of one of those like no doy moments since the beginning but also could be kind of building into that idea that game of thrones has propagated since it first came about which is that you know don't buy into the ideas don't read prophecies too literally because they're open to interpretation and are very often misinterpreted which is often what leads to you know the characters suffering tragic fates when tragedies say otherwise you know but i don't know what did you think of this sequence uh, I, I agree that it came out of nowhere and that kind of disappoints me because I feel like a lot of great writing comes from setting up and paying things off. And, you know, what kind of, I guess, saves this sequence is that you feel with Melisandre and Stannis and the whole idea that he was the chosen one and Melisandre was like dead wrong. And, it, you know, he, he got executed, you know, in the north and and really is not going to sit on that Iron Throne. Uh, to a certain degree, Melisandre was wrong, you know, and 
she obviously has chosen a new champion in, in Jon Snow by resurrecting him. And, you know, it, really, Melisandre is kind of taking a backseat as well. She she doesn't really have her faith anymore. But clearly it's like, is it Jon Snow or is it, you know, Daenerys? And I think the introduction of the Red Priest, uh, you know, our priestess here, basically is showing you that there's two viable candidates for the Iron Throne uh, that the God of Light is backing. And so, you know, if, if you're watching this show and you have all these different gods and you're, you're trying to believe like which one's real or which ones are active, which ones are just, you know, whatever, uh, the red, you know, priest and priestess, um, they essentially have magic and we've seen that magic and we know the Lord of Light is out there. So it's kind of narrowing it down to two possible uh, people for the throne, you know, is it going to be Daenerys and is it going to be John? And so I kind of like the fact that you're bringing uh, the Lord of Light into Marine and sort of uh, aligning it with um, Daenerys. But again, it doesn't really go that far, if I remember correctly. Um, it really you know, doesn't. I, I think it's like yeah. you see one brief sequence of a re another red priestess, and you know, speaking the good word of Daenerys um, through, you know, when Tyrion and Varys are walking through the city before Varys mysteriously disappears when before right conveniently before the slave masters start attacking. We'll get to that when we get to what might be my least one of my least favorite episodes of the entire show later on in the scene. But and the crazy part and really the thing that that I think ultimately makes it a not good scene in hindsight is the fact that Kinvara doesn't ask for anything. She doesn't ask for any sort of payment, any sort of tribute. She kind of just gets a one up on Varys and is like, yeah, sure. I'll come in and do this for you. You know, she is the one who is meant to be. And I don't know. I just feel like there's, there's a little bit there. There's certainly a lot of give and not a whole lot of take here. And that kind of always rubs I, me. Well, the I just, way. I just wonder where they were thinking of taking this storyline. Right. Because, and it's very clear you know, to me that they had no intention of taking this anywhere. Exactly. So if you have like someone that's the leader of another interest group, you know, uh, here we have a red priestess, like, yeah, they're going to want something, whether it's power or money or, or whatever the case may be, uh, just influence over the crown. And ultimately, nothing happens, you know, it sort of fades into the background. So, um, again, it's it's one of those things where it's kind of intriguing. Uh, you're setting this thing up and I'm like, OK, yeah, I, I can kind of go with this for a little bit of time. Uh, but then nothing really happens. Like, you know, we'll, we'll see. I guess we'll rewatch the rest of the season we'll, we'll see what else um you know the lord of light has in store for marine but from what i remember it, it's not much it's not much exactly so moving on so let's get to it the king's move this is a big moment so this is a big moment for you because you have surprisingly been a much bigger fan of the ironborn storyline this entire season than i would have you know like i said it's one of those famously Listen. this is probably the only storyline for me that was awesome in the moment and then kind of got progressively worse and worse as time went on to the point where it even ruined it and like i said it all comes in with with the one treatment of really the last character from the book the last major character from the books that they had to adapt with it being euron and then just completely dropping the ball on him and just based off how the king's move goes like i said this is another sequence that played out already in the books that played out much differently and much later on in the show and so i have obviously got a lot of expectations going into this that were unfortunately not met just because of how the show would change since its inception but i don't know you you I I don't know. I, I can tell this is a moment that you've been waiting for for a while. Well, you know, listen, the, the Iron Islands has sort of had a sabbatical for a little bit of time and, and now much has happened. Like, yeah, we got, you know, Euron throwing, you know, what's his face over the bridge and you know, we got a couple scenes here and there. Ballad Greyjoy, rest in peace. Such yeah, a great character. Yeah, yeah. Already forgot his name. Yeah, there's no reason to remember him after the fifth season. But uh, hey, uh, <laughs> you know, the the main thing is it, they've sort of been on the back burner um, really ever since like uh, Theon got captured and maimed and became Reek. You know, after Yara tried to save him, uh, the Iron Islands have not really been that great of a storyline. And they haven't even they haven't been they haven't even been a storyline. Exactly. So now where they're back and I think it's coming in a strong way. I think, you know, it's like Yara goes up and she's like, yeah, I want to be the leader. And it's like, we've never had a queen. And, and why should we choose you when Theon's like literally right. right there? And Theon comes and he gives his grand speech on why Yara should be, you know, the leader. And then Euron comes in and says, well, you know, he, of course he wants a woman because, you know, he's been maimed, you know, like yeah. he, he's more Play, of a woman now than that he is a man. Toxic masculinity. 
Exactly. So again, you're on, he knows his audience and he's playing to it. And the fact is, it's pretty clear that Euron is going to win because, you know, he's very charismatic. He comes in, yeah, I, I killed the old man. He was leading us down a path of certain destruction, and we would be still on it if it wasn't for me. And all people seem to points, accept that. I will that. say that. All valid points that Euron does bring up. Like I said, this, this is where I will give Euron credit because as much of a cartoon as he becomes in the last two seasons, at the very least for this season, while they actually still have him as a regular human character, all valid points all around that he brings up. Yeah, yeah. Listen, like Euron is uh, right now a really good character. I think when he meets Cersei and he's uh, trying to seduce her, so to speak, that's when he becomes that's really a bad, you know, uh, cartoon character. Uh, but like, he's like this weird, uh, you so know, strange. Uh, yeah, he this like lustful pirate is basically what he becomes yeah. in in later seasons. Yeah. But uh, the fact is, here it's it's. There's a certain code that the Iron Islands has, you know, been shown to us, and Euron is able to charismatically take control and win. And why they're sort of, you know, um, basically baptizing him as the new leader in the the sea. You know, Yara and Theon go and take their supporters, and they steal the best ships in the fleet. Uh, and this leads to Euron basically making his first decree of like, I want you to go home. I want you to chop down every single tree. I want all the women to, you know, basically spin flax for the sails. You give me a thousand ships, I'll give you the world. And, you know, I think it's a really awesome sequence of like, hell yeah, something's going to happen in the Iron Islands. They're entering the game, you know, and um, again, you know, you read the book, you have a little more insight into who Euron is supposed to be. Uh, you know, we, the Game of Thrones television audience who have not really seen uh, anything, you know, haven't read the books and just know about the show. You know, we're finally getting a character that's like, oh, this this might actually be a charismatic leader that can do some damage at the head of the Iron Islands. Um, and so I think they do that job of really setting us up for what could be something that's interesting. Yeah, uh, I agree. But then so, again, I know my, what happens in that with it. So my ire with this storyline, like I said, comes from, I will say, because this is kind of the last of the lingo. I remember last season I was complaining a lot how they were taking a lot of the stuff that was still in that were still major storylines of the books and either compressing them or into one and rushing past them or kind of dragging them out to the point where they just became like unbearable. And this, and what's so weird about season six is so much of season six is past season five, but there's still a couple of loose lingering threads left over from the book, like everything going on with Sam on his journey to Bravos. For the most part, everything going on with Arya and everything going on with the King's Moot and the Ironborn in this season, with the exception of Theon going home, is still very much mired in stuff that is going on in between the Feast for Crows and the Dance of Dragons. And so what's confusing for me about this scene is that is that constantly I, I've tried my best to get past it, but I just cannot get past the fact that this happens at a totally different time and has a completely different context behind it in the books, in the sense of where the King's Moot happens as a direct result of Bal on Greyjoy dying at Euron's hand, but it's a direct result of Melisandre's leeching all the way back in season three when Stannis threw all three of those leeches into the fire. Like I said, they did Joffrey, obviously, because they did Joffrey's wedding, and they did Rob because they did the Red Wedding, but famously, Balon was kind of left out of that because they kind of just did the whole... Yara going to save Theon and then fucking off for a season until they conveniently brought it back and because they needed your because they just decided to bring in Euron because that was like the last character from the books that they decided to bring in and so as a result you have it to where the reason why Yara lose or as Asha as she's known in the books loses is because she actually is coming from a despondent place she's had to retreat from the you know she still has this one castle she still maintains control over Deepwood Mott in the books, she only returned, you know, in the north, you know, because that's the thing is that the Iron Boards will have very much more of a presence in the show, in the books at that point, I should say, than in the show. And so Yara retreats for the King's Move, but is in kind of a lesser spot because Euron is just such a different character in the books. Euron is just this force to be reckoned with to a point where it's almost like everyone votes for him almost because they're scared of him, you know, because that's how just intimidating of a character he is. Versus the character, versus how it plays out here, there's literally no reason why anyone should vote for Euron. Like, Theon brings up all legitimate points against Euron's talk. You know, Euron brings up these points about Balon, but Theon even says it. He's like, look, Yara was here. Yara was leading us. Yara was the one that was essentially kind of, you know, salvaging us in the time of when, um, 
you know, of, of when Balon was leading us astray, you know? And for all those guys just kind of turn on him and turn on Euron because Euron gives him a bunch of empty promises that has become to find out how he has absolutely no way of carrying out because the minute that he gets crowned king, Fionn and Euron immediately take the fleet and just jet. And just completely jet and kind of fill the void of Victarion's arc where in the books, Euron sends his other brother, Victarion, who again is not a character in the show at all, um what's it called, East to woo Daenerys, and Victarion plans on marrying her um, himself. They change that up a little bit where Theon and Yara go East in order to try and gain the alliance of Daenerys in order to take back their home from Euron. So that context, it kind of works, but it's like, just, it, it all revolves around Euron to me, and it all falls apart because, again, the cracks are already showing because all that he's full of is empty promises, and he's literally stripped of his ability to do anything for the rest of the season because they're like, okay, we got all these other storylines to wrap up, so we're going to kind of leave Euron there and then bring it back at a later point. So that's kind of what wrecks the King's move for me. It kind of makes it, it and really the whole Ironborn storyline kind of uninteresting, you know? I'm not saying there was never a chance for them to have a great arc, but it's just like, it's it's kind of the one of the last vestiges of, okay, I'm seeing what this is, but this could have been so much more awesome, you know? And that's kind of the problem that I consistently have with it. So, yeah, no, right I back. agree with you. It, for the most part, it, it, you know, from a standpoint of like, this is your first watch through, you're kind of like in the mode where you're like, let's go, Iron Islands, it's finally going to happen. And then, you know, in hindsight of knowing the whole entire series, you're just like, oh, yeah, this is. This is not going to amount to anything. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's I agree with you there. It's, it's crazy pirate stuff. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like I still like it, but like at the end of the day, uh, you know, I don't like where it actually ends up going. I like the idea of where it could have went. Exactly. Exactly. So let's get back to it. You know, we get back to the main sequence. Like I said, we, the main sequence, the main talking point, the title point of this episode. Like I said, the door. Obviously, as is revealed about the horror reveal. We talked about so much of this in the first half of this episode that I don't know how much more we have to say. But I will say that again, this, the the kind of the build up to it where. It kind of happened as a result of Bran working out a little bit too far just because he's kind of impatient and bored and doesn't feel like the Three-Eyed Raven is teaching him at, like, a commendable rate, which I will say I understand where he's coming from because he's a young, horny teenager, and the Three-Eyed Raven is, like, this 80-year-old dude who's literally spent most of his life, you know, in it, stuck in a tree, just kind of daydreaming and drifting and seeing the world. It's one of those things where, in hindsight, I'm not really sure what the purpose of the Three-Eyed Raven serves, where he's kind of this collective knowledge and wisdom of the entire world, but at what service, you know? Because the minute that the, that the Night King gets access to him, he just immediately kills him you know so that well i think this the storyline is that he you know obviously can work through time and you know he can also work and control creatures and whatnot but the three eye raven is uh, is a lot more he has more capabilities and you know bran is going to have to do a lot of that training as the new three eyed raven on his own he's going to have to you know, probably even you could have a, a whole spin off series, you know, uh, hopefully directed by uh, the guy who, who did the show running for Legion on FX. Yeah, right. Uh, Noah Hawley would really do that show. Yeah, do that you could you show, could have Bran just working through time and, and learning bits and pieces about, you know, the three eyed raven and, and stuff he needs to know. And, you know, just weird things happening um, in the Game of Thrones universe throughout, you know, the whole uh, history of time, not just like, you know, what happens in, in the, you know, vanilla series here, Game of Thrones and what's going to happen, uh, when House of Dragons, you know, uh, takes place and, and any of the other, you know, IPs that come out based on this, uh, uh, stuff. Um, you know, it's one of those things where I think my biggest problem with this episode, and, and this might be what, you know, causes a problem with this storyline is when Bran shows up in the army of the dead. And they're just kind of like standing there at terracotta, uh, terracotta soldier, -like, soldier yeah. style. Yeah. And they're just staring in the distance. And it's like, brands like, well, walking uh, real through. Quick, did you, did you um, notice the one extra who kind of like shifted a little bit of size so that he could kind of pass through? Did you notice that? Cause I noticed that. Yeah, this time. It, I'm like, I see you extra. I see you. Yeah. It's, it's really like, I think the main thing that's, that's really problematic with this entire sequence. And this is what I was teasing at the beginning of the episode is that when brand shows up, 
the army of the dead is it literally just staring off into the distance like you know are they at some sort of like bizarre zombie wedding and it's like they're on the dance floor and they're waiting for the night king to be like one hop this time you know i i don't know what's going on uh in the middle of this ice field why are they stagnant why are they staring off into the distance like last season they they threatened Jon snow and it's like we're coming to get you all and then this season they're standing in the middle of a field doing nothing right. and you know obviously we never got a sense of what the night king was doing this season this is it you know we're being reintroduced to him and he's just standing around in a field and so when bran you know brazenly walks up and you know the night king notices him and makes his mark on him uh all of a sudden you know he wakes up and it's like oh he touched me he burned me whatever and the three eye raven's like yeah he's coming here now and he's gonna kill us all Exactly. You know, like, so basically, I was waiting for like a red formant dumbass to just be thrown in there, where it's like, come yeah, on, so, man. So, man, it, 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 what comes down to it is that this whole idea that the tree is compromised and the three eye raven's going to be killed and Bran's got to escape, the whole premise of this sequence uh, is just rushed. It, it's like not really set up at all. It's just thrown in our face. You know, it's like, yeah, the Night King, he just spends his, you know, weekdays and weeknights and every single moment standing in the middle of a field with a bunch of zombies doing nothing. You know, it's like, what was going on? Like, why was he pursuing? Was he going south? Like, maybe maybe he should have been, like, killing some, like, rangers of, of the Night's Watch. And then all of a sudden he sees Bran and, you know, like, that takes him off course. You know, like maybe show like, oh, hey, we got to go back to the wall and we got to tell them that the Night King's on the move again. You know, like what is going on strategically above the wall um, where the Night King suddenly gets his attention distracted by Bran and goes after him? You know, because, you know, the whole idea that the Night King is interested in Three-Eyed Raven and Bran is very interesting the the whole backstory like you said where the children of the the forest created the night walkers like all that stuff is awesome so it almost plays out like like almost like this interest this interesting kind of revenge quest where it's like okay you know we're on our quest of just slaughtering everything in our path every living thing in our path we can kind of take a little bit of extra you know joy in the in being able to essentially you know turn on our creators you know like i I, like i said that's the one thing that kind of saves this arc is the fact of learning that the white walkers were essentially kind of this fail-safe weapon system that ultimately just kind of got out of control you know it kind of reminds you of so many different like bad steven seagal and sylvester Stallone movies from the 80s where it's like you know they're the baddest guy there that's being sent to take down the other baddest guy there but then it turns out that the baddest guy that they're being sent to take down was really the first project you know yeah again it's a trope that we've seen done in movies and tv like since time of memoriam but like i don't know i felt like that 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 was like okay so game of thrones can still like it's one of, it's one of those tropes that i like where it's like okay so game of thrones can still take some of those old school story tropes and run with them yeah listen you know i think this sequence um you know, really kind of comes out of nowhere. We don't know why the Night King is is interested in Bran and the Three Eyed Raven. Like, obviously, I think they fill in the blanks as time goes on. But uh, it would have been really nice to have set that stuff up, really set up that you know, what does it mean that the Night King is switching directions, his attention away from the wall, and going after Bran? Like, you know, does that allow you know some for pressure? to be released from, you know, the wall. And that allows, you know, John and Sansa to really take that moment to go south and deal with the Boltons. Um, You know, so like, I I think there's a little more story complexity that could be involved here. It just kind of seems like it's just thrown in there. And I, I think that's really what, you know, makes me feel like this sequence is, it starts off like, oh man, this is kind of a mess. And then you get this like creepy, scary, aggressive, like, you know, all the, the creatures like crawling on the walls yeah, oh, in the tunnel effects. and, great and as well. the deaths of everything. Heads, like, everyone, they kill, take out the children of the forest, even though, even yeah, the, like they're fireballs, like they're legend oh, of Zelda well, fireballs, and, 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 you know, an it's amazing, amazing action sequence. Like the action is amazingly well done. Exactly. And, you know, and then we get to the point where like Bran is staying too long in the vision again uh, to the point where he sees the three eyed Raven disappear in one of the coolest uh, effects that they have in the show. It's pretty Um, awesome. 
Yeah, it's like he just kind of like vaporizes, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a little it's bit like of like cloth. It's a little bit of like Adobe After Effects dissolve, but like mix it with a little bit of coloration in order to like make it like feel like you really feel like the essence of that character has been obliterated. Probably one of the most creative deaths that I think I've seen in a show ever. Yeah, and then you have uh, you know everyone like uh, Willis is there and he's starting to pay attention to Bran. Bran is like warging you know Odor in the, in present time. Which is then having some right. sort of impact on well, it's Willis a in the past. Well, a couple different things. It's, it's Willis. It, so it's a combination of Bran realizing what he's doing, realizing what he's said that he's essentially dooming this kid to this life of servitude and literally only being able to say this one word. And I've always had this theory, and I've never really been confident in it up until this point. But I do truly believe now that with his purpose served, Hodor became Willis again in those last moments right before he died. You know, because he's not screaming out. Um, his name, Hodor, he's just screaming in pain as those things are clawing away at him, trying to get out, you know, as he's literally just using his massive bolt to keep that thing closed. So here's my last question for you before we kind of wrap it up and get out of here is, do you think, so obviously the Three-Eyed Raven knew the entire time that Bran was ultimately going to do this to Willis and cause him to become Hodor and kind of, you know, cause him to, you know, you know, fulfill this, this fate, ultimately this doomed fate, rather, this doomed prophecy, and Bran kind of realizing what he did to Hodor in the moment and then kind of having no remorse about it after the fact is, I think, kind of one of the more chilling and underrated moments. But do you think that Willis saw Bran and that's what started to cause him to go nuts? Or do you think it was a matter of, Bran working into Willis because what's so fascinating about the working is that whenever we see Bran warg into someone we always see his eyes go up but Bran was already technically in whatever that warg space flashback dream vision is and we never see Bran warg we only see Willis slash Hodor's eyes warg so like where do you think the connection comes from? That's kind of like one of the last like looming threads. It's almost like Damon Lindelof esque how they carry it out. I feel like it's. I feel like I'm wondering if there was some consultation of Damon Lindelof that happened because this was that because season six of Game of Thrones happened on an off season. You know, the leftovers had just finished its second season at that time, and I know the leftovers tackled some of the similar things that lost it, although not as many. So I just wanted your take on that because it's something that I've yeah. constantly wondered about. For me, my take is that, you know, in reality, in the snow, Bran is already sort of working uh, into the past. And, you know, at some point he controls Odor into the present. And so it's all he's he's using his ability from the present. And when he uses it, when he's doing two things at once, be, being in the past and also working, you know, Willis in the, you know, or Odor in the present. Uh, that inadvertently carries over into the past. And because we see young Willis sort of, you know, do the, the warg eyes into his back of his head. Um, and for some reason, when Mira screaming, hold the door, hold the door, hold the door, um, you know, Bran at this point is a conduit, uh, not only to present day Odor, but to past Willis. And, you know, that's, that's really sort of what's connecting them uh, you know, in, in, in time. Uh, and that, that really is what created this, um, I, I guess, uh, a, a, as it would have been seen by the, the Winterfell residents and, and the North as a disability in, in young Willis. Um, so it's very interesting. Like, obviously it's never explained. Um, but I, I think it's one of those things where it's brand, as a young sort of new three eye Raven really doing too much too soon. Um, and it's probably the final lesson uh, that the three eyed Raven can teach Bran is that, you know, you're dealing with these, you know, immense powers. And, you know, if you strain yourself, uh, you can have really uh, long term impact on something that you didn't intend. Um you know, and it's 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 really him showing the true power of the three eyed raven. Absolutely. Yeah. So and like I said, unfortunately, despite the fact that it is not at all talked about, but like I said, it's a lot of deaths. We say goodbye to a couple of different legacy characters. Obviously, again, I was even keeping track. I'm like, yeah, because Hodor's death is so impactful that it almost overshadows Summer, who also unfortunately meets the end of his life. And I'm realizing I'm like, oh, my God, that's it. That's the last, you know, the of the six original direwolves, there are only two left now that are alive with Summer and Shaggy Dog both meeting their ends this season. You know, with Ghost, obviously, still with John somewhere, although he hasn't been seen at all since episode two. And then obviously, you know, Nymeria, who is wandering around in the wild, but also, you know, 
know, the, we, who we see briefly in the following season. Those two obviously make it through the show alive. But yeah, so RIP to Summer, RIP to Hodor, two legacy characters that we've literally been with since season one. RIP to the Three-Eyed Raven, the Children of the Forest. And like I said, it's a big moment. It's a lot of big deaths, and it's only setting up for the last half. Like I said, we're through the first half and officially into the second half of season six. So be sure to keep tuning in as we wind down. Like I said, we've only got three more weeks until Battle of the Bastards. I cannot wait to recap that. But in the meantime, Pat, where can the good people follow you on the interwebs? Oh, no, you muted out. Your mic cut out. Here I'll, do, uh, here, I'll do the plug for you. Don't worry. Follow him. No, don't at- worry about it, Don. Okay, I, you know, hey, listen, sometimes, uh, you know, when I cough and all that stuff, I put it on mute. So I forgot that I was on that uh, that mute button. So, uh, yeah, you know, people, uh, you can check me out on Instagram at Patrick W. Huber. You know, it's it's that's it. That's where I'm posting uh, some photos, some videos, whatever I feel like. Um, that's my social media choice for the time being. Awesome. I'm waiting for your pictures and eventual videos from some of, you know, from the band gig this past Sunday. And of course, you can follow me at Movie Nerd Reviews across all platforms. Be sure to follow the official Talking TV podcast, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter pages where we post there every single day, as well as TikTok. We are on TikTok as well. Be sure to follow that if you are not following us there already. Be sure to subscribe to us on Twitch and, and YouTube. And as always, people, 12 seasons in a short film and watch more fucking movies. We'll see you guys next time.